Good morning. Yes, I'm, I'm Steve, one of the leaders in church, and I want to extend a really warm welcome to you all, especially if this is your, you're new to this church, you are really, really welcome. And um, this morning we're starting a new series called The Journey. Uh, life has often been called a journey. Um, and we're all going somewhere, whether we realize or not, in life. Um, and we're experiencing, I hope, something along the way. It's not just about the destination. It's about the experience along the way. But are we going where we want to go? Are we experiencing things in the now and the moment? We only have one life to live, don't we? Um, and Christians have often described life or the journey as pilgrimage and you might have heard of uh, Muslims going to Mecca and Christians going to Israel and to Jerusalem and a few other places along the way um, and and you might have heard of uh, Pete Gregg for example who who um, describes himself as the bewildered founder of 24-7 prayer and um, Recently, he went on a pilgrimage from Iona, which is on the west, southwest coast of Scotland, to Lindisfarne, which is on the northeast of England, Northumbria, and did that walk 300 miles or something. And um, he talked about pilgrimage, and he defined pilgrimage, I think quite helpfully, as saying that it was a journey with God to know more of God. And that's what we're thinking about here. This is my subject for this morning, is a journey with God to know more of God. That's what we're doing as our autumn series. And I've got kind of four points this morning. The first thing is, why start? The second is, um, our series. The third is suffering. And the fourth, stumbling. But in order to do this, we need to look at psalm 84 so if you've got a bible or your phone this is a really good moment to look at it because we're going to unpack quite a bit of that so it's probably helpful to have that in front of you uh, as we go along and the context of this psalm is that the jews were asked to go up to jerusalem three times a year for festivals there was a pilgrimage that they went on to jerusalem and Jerusalem and the temple were very much symbolic places of the presence of God. And, um, and I think it's helpful as we read this to make it really relevant to us, for us to think about what that means to us. When we read temple and Jerusalem and things like that, actually we need to think of it in terms of experiencing God and his presence, his reality. That's what it means to us today. So let's read from Psalm 84, verse 1. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Psalm 84, verse 1. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, for they are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. And this is our verse for this morning, and perhaps for the series. Setting our hearts on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength, till each appears before God in Zion. That's Jerusalem, another name. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favour on your anointed one. 
Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from him whose way of life is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. So why? Why should we take this journey? Verse 5. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Why should we set our hearts on pilgrimage? I think the psalmist has experienced something of the goodness of God. For he says right at the start, how lovely is your dwelling place. He's thinking back of times in his life that he's experienced something of the goodness of God. And he says better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Again, he's thinking about some kind of experience that he's had when he's experienced the true and the living God. And the psalmist goes on and says, encourages us into more of God. Because in in verse 11 he says, for the the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose way of life is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in him. I don't know whether you like you probably do you like feeling the sun and the warmth and you just feel a bit better don't you and God is described as a a sun and the sun of course also has that is the source of all life for us God is the source of all life he is a sun I love it also that he's thought as a shield as well, that we don't get sunburn then. But, you know, we, but but God is a shield. Another way of interpreting that word is he's the sovereign. He's the almighty. He's the protector. He's the one that looks after us. And it goes on. The psalmist says, you know, he's a sun and a shield and he bestows favor. That's gifts and blessings that we don't deserve and honor. And he's generous. No good thing does he withhold from him whose way is blameless. God is good. We should set out on this journey because God is good. But why continue this journey? Many of you have been on this journey for a lot longer than me. And uh, if that's possible, yes it is. (laughs) Um, But... You know, there is way more of God to know, isn't there, and experience. And I love the example of the Apostle Paul writing in Philippians. He says, I want to know Christ, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Well, how can Paul know more? I mean, Paul was in Jerusalem very soon after the death and resurrection of Jesus. He saw and met Jesus on the road to Damascus. His life was totally changed round by that experience of God. He knew something of God. He knew something of God speaking to him. And yet Paul says, more. I want to know more of you, Jesus. I want to know more of your power. Paul had healed people, raised people from the dead. He knew something of God's power, and yet he says, there's more. And he says he wants to have fellowship with with Jesus in his sufferings, and we think, hmm, don't like that bit. I'm happy with the other two, that one. Mm -mm." But I think Paul probably, I think, saw it like this. You see, he knew that Jesus' truths and Jesus' way and Jesus' life was the thing that people most needed in the world. Jesus was the answer that people really, really needed. So if he was suffering because he was trying to do the Jesus thing, He knew he was on, he was doing the most important task of all. He knew he was doing the journey, the real journey, the real thing. 
And that's why he was prepared to be in fellowship with sufferings for Jesus. But Paul goes on, doesn't he? In verse 12, he says this, and I like this. And, the, and, and he says this is for, for everyone, even the mature. He says this is for everyone. He says, press on into more. He says, not that I have obtained all this or I have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, this is the thing he's doing. This is the journey that he's on. I do not consider myself yet to take hold of, of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, since the journey, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. There is a destination. There absolutely is. But he's wanting to be on that journey. What about my journey? I want to just share a little bit there. For many years, it's been my practice to journal ad hocly, perhaps every couple of weeks, once a week, now and again. And um, what I often do is I'll, at the end of the year, in the Christmas break, I will read that journal. And journaling is really helpful to me. Uh, I will read that journal and I will ask God for a verse for the following year. And a couple of years ago, God gave me this verse, better is one day in your courts. And the, and the following verse is there. And um, why was that? Because I'd looked over the year and I'd experienced God in some days that I thought those are the days are far better than all the other days. And they're the days that I really, really want. And then when I was studying Psalm 84 with Tim Keller's yearly devotion, where he starts... January the 1st, Psalm 1, and then moves through all the numbers, the numbers of the Psalms, I found that Psalm 84 was on my birthday. And I thought, God, you're in this. You're speaking to me. You're encouraging me to try and get into this Psalm a bit more. I love it when he does that. And um, let me just share you a couple, very quickly, just a couple of those little days I'm sure you've got your own days. I hope you have. Well, one of these days, I was exhausted. I'd done some stressy work in the morning with, with Rolls Royce. I was walking over here to food bank. I was struggling a bit. And I was just saying, God, please help me. Help me to love these people today. And um, I, just, I just got chatting with so many people. And I was able to pray for an incredible number of people. And... Every person that I prayed for said thank you and were really blessed. And, and quite a few of them were moved with emotion. And I thought, you know, that was a day where God showed up. And I thought, I want more days like that, those kind of days. And another time I was, um, I was on a prayer walk. Um, I was, I'd read the Lectio 365 app that day, which encouraged you to think about... If God was going to give you a name today, what, what name would he give you? And um, immediately, you know, this name came to my head. And, and I thought, is it in the Bible? Well, not that every name had to be in the Bible, but this one was in the Bible very few times. And it really blessed, blessed me that God had spoken in this way. I wouldn't, it wasn't something that was in my head it was just out of the blue. And then as I prayed for other people, I had other names just kept coming and coming. And I knew what the meanings of those were. And I thought, well, yeah, that's a lovely day when God, we hear God's voice. Because he's living and active. And, and I thought, you know, as I began on that year, I thought, I want more of those kind of days. Those God encounter days where God is moving and God is speaking. Now, <clears throat> God being in a day isn't always so dramatic is it i think and we need to remember that that god is in every day whatever we're feeling he is there but um 
And, and the expression of that can be very different. You know, sometimes it's just we feel joy. Sometimes it's just we have hope. Sometimes we have love pouring out from us. That is the presence of God. And sometimes our emotions are, Ugh, and we think, but actually we have faith. And we know God is there. And that's still a day with God so much in our and that, and so that's what I was running after. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I want. I want more days like those days that God is in. I'm sure you have those days. But I wanted to be more in his courts. And so in recent years, I've tried to shape my life um, so that I have more of those kind of days. And so the invitation for us as church this autumn and today and this autumn is to have more of those kind of days, to set our hearts on pilgrimage, to set our hearts on knowing more of God's presence in our, in our lives. The big problem for us is how? <laughs> you know, how can, we, how can we take this journey? Um, some of you will know that I went to New Wine Christian Fellowship in the summer and when I got there, I realized I'd left my suitcase with all my clothes in at home. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you can laugh. It's all right. I didn't particularly laugh at the time. But, <laughs> but you know, actually, it, had, it was on my, my list of things to pack. I'd even packed it upstairs. I'd forgotten to bring it downstairs to the things I was packing. So I didn't bump into it in the in the hall and so it didn't get packed and what we need to do in life is we need to have things that we're going to bump into in everyday life that remind us of God so we don't forget them you know we can forget really really important things in life but what we need to do is have things that we bump into and really this autumn term series is about that that we're going to give you a number of things that we, we need to bump into in life so that we can build a relationship with God. And we're going to be doing that by drawing on various Old Testament passages uh, that we can learn from. So that's one way that we can find the how is through this series through the autumn. The second thing I think what I want to talk about is suffering because I think that sometimes throws us off the journey and we struggle but actually suffering is, um, we need to keep going through the hard times. It's, this is where God is doing his deepest work in our lives. And we just somehow hang in there and keep going. This is what the psalmist said. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. The word Baca, some tr Bible translators think weeping. It's the valley of weeping. The valley of pain. Valley probably was a place of no water, a desert, arid, and yet it becomes a place of pools and springs because their hearts are set on pilgrims, because they keep going through the difficulties. They go from strength to strength until they appear before Zion. It's hard, but if we can, it's rewarding. And perhaps like me, you, particularly in the valleys, and maybe just sometimes most various days especially perhaps when you get up you think you don't feel like the psalmist in verse 2 who says his heart and flesh cry out to the living God does your flesh cry out to the living God I have to say mine doesn't always you know it's morely crying out to the non-God things selfish desires and passions over desires you know, I need comfort, I need food, I need this and that. But what I'm learning is this, that in those moments where our body isn't crying out to God, it's crying out for other things, is that we take that to God. And we say, God, I'm lacking. 
I'm needing. Would you come to me more in those moments? Will you come to me? So, we'll come back to this in the series when we talk about suffering. But suffering can be a place of greatest growth in our lives. I mean, the second thing that I want to, to sort of talk to you about is, is stumbling. Because we will all stumble on the journey. And my experience is that as I've tried to sort of shape my life around wanting to have more of those kind of days with God and his presence, is I've realized I'm incredibly not perfect. And I'm deeply aware of my failings. And my stumblings are very clear to me. And maybe it, it jumped out of you in the Bible passage that it said, no good thing does he withhold from him whose walk is blameless. So, okay, so none of us are good. That verse doesn't mean to anything to none of us because none of us are blameless. We all fall over. We all do things wrong. But I want to suggest to you there's a couple of different ways of looking at that. First of all, um, the word blameless, and it's used quite a bit in the Psalms, actually means sound or whole. And so it's better, I think, translated integrity. And you think, well, I'm not a person of integrity. Well, um, but most dictionary definitions of integrity talk about kind of two things. One is the sense of honesty and reality, authenticity, but also that sense of, um, of moral moral principles so it's those kind of two things together and I think that you know what I get from that is that honesty really matters with God and while God is primarily and really really interested and trusts those of character he also works with us (laughs) or with me (laughs) that isn't quite got it there but who's trying along the way who's trying to be real and honest with God, that I'm not quite made it, that I'm not quite there. But he works with those whose hearts are set on that pilgrimage, those who are wanting to make that move. So the message version, I think, helpfully translates it like this. Um, All sunshine and sovereign is God, generous in gifts and glory, He doesn't scrimp with his traveling companions. It's smooth sailing all the way with the God of angel armies. Wonderful. He doesn't scrimp with his traveling companions. I love that. If you're honest and you're seeking that that place of of pilgrimage and you're you're trying to to follow his way, he, he... He's working with traveling companions. And I think that that's wonderful. I find that so encouraging and helps me to take heart and for us to take heart as we travel this journey. It's about having a close relationship with Jesus. So we need to review our lives, our hearts, repent of our sin. Jesus forgives us and welcomes us back in. It's all because of Jesus. Jesus... Christ. Christ means anointed. Hold on to that thought. So the second thought of why blameless is important, that it, it, it does apply, this promise does apply to us, is the Hebrew in verse 10, where it says better than, actually starts with for better than. So it's, it's linking back to the previous verses So verse 8 and 9, which I've often thought, gosh, what are they doing there? They seem a bit odd. But actually, it says, verse 8, Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty, listen to me, God of Jacob, look on our shield, which could be the king. O God, look with favor on your anointed one. He's praying to God about the king. So that, for so that the better days can come. So why is that? Well, if we understand the context, if you have a strong, good king, there is security and peace in the land. And that's why he's praying. They can go up to do pilgrimage and to go to Jerusalem because the king is strong. And that's why he's praying for them. 
Pilgrimage was only possible because of the good king. And that is true of us too. Pilgrimage, the journey is only possible because of our good king, Jesus Christ. He is the anointed king. He is the anointed priest who enables us to come into a relationship with him and keep going on this journey. I love the verses in Hebrews 4.14 which says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, that's the presence of God, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. We do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses. And it goes on. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. I could preach all day on this bit. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Wonderful verses, mercy, that we are forgiven. And there's grace to help us in our time of need on this journey when we stumble and we fall over. So how does this land for us today? I want to invite myself and I want to invite you all to join the journey. To set our hearts on pilgrimage. Even if you're struggling with the faith idea, you're not even sure there is a God. Even if you're in the valley of weeping and suffering and struggling, maybe you feel rubbish because you've stumbled. To set our hearts on pilgrimage. You know, our vision as church is continuing to reproduce the life of Jesus. I think there is nothing or anyone as beautiful as Jesus Far and away, his message, lived in, brings a richness and colour and hope and joy to life that nothing else can bring. But as Eugene Peterson said, and he's the translator of the message version of the Bible, and he said at the end of his life, he said, unless the truths of Jesus are combined with the ways of Jesus... That's like the practices, the how-tos. We will not have the life of Jesus. We will not experience the life of Jesus. So this autumn, we're looking at the how of the journey. In other words, the Jesus ways. The ways in which that we individually and as church can have life. Yes, individually and as a church and as a local community. Needs the life of Jesus. And last week, Stuart talked about our vision for this year. And I'm convinced that if we start, and if we continue on that journey, this vision can become reality. Not because of us, but because of God. And I end with these last verses. I often, as I walk... And I do this regularly. And I feel the sun. I think of this verse. I think of God's warmth and his grace. For the Lord is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he, who, does he withhold from him whose walk is blameless. Or is a traveling companion. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Let's just pray a moment. Lord, you are so good. Um, I thank you that you're gracious. You don't treat us as our sins deserve. And you welcome us when we stumble and we're struggling in our suffering. Thank you for your mercy. Your grace to help us in our time of need. Would you come and give us what we need individually as a church? In order not that we'd feel blessed up, but God, that people in our community would know your love and your peace and your wholeness. Amen.